Hello, welcome to Straw Family Farm, take two. I'm Christy, and we're gonna get right on into it. Um, it's been a really rough week on me, and you will soon find out why. So, in the chapel, it says, it's Palms 116.15, and it says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. So, we'll get to that here in a little bit. But, yeah, totally hooked. I have nothing. Well, okay, so I have this. I, the ends are not woven in, okay? But this is the, um, I think I even have it backwards. Uh, I think it goes like that. Anyway, this is the headband I was struggling with. It fits. It's much better. I've revamped the things, and it's just a, a twisted knot headband. It's got the blue, the gray the tan, the white, it's okay. Um, I have not worked any more on that kit. So yeah, for in the basket, I have the same stuff that I was working on before. I didn't even work any on the little blue mindless knit or mindless crochet that I have. Um, it's still pretty much the same length. Um, so I know that's kind of disappointing, but in real life, there are weeks that you're not going to get stuff done and you're not going to uh, be able to show progress. Okay, so um, on the Geo um, pullover, I'm still on the other round. I haven't even looked at it. Okay, so it's been a rough week and I really didn't do any crocheting so we're going to go right on into um on the wheel i finished the one pound of white native and it made 1124 yards of a two ply so um you'll get to see that here in just a few minutes and then i switched to um the two four ounce skeins I had that was gifted to me um, by Jane, Angora Jane. And again, this is not showing, it's not as purple as that. It, it really isn't. I don't know. I've looked around the house for a better spot to do this, but it's not one. There's really not one. It is a burgundy. It, it's like a maroonish burgundy. And I have one spool, one four ounce ball done, braid done. And then I have the other ones still on the wheel. And then I'm going to apply them together and see how much I get and what I can make with that. Um, so the other thing that I have on the wheel is, oh, sorry, is I drop spindle and did some on the wheel. Uh, and that is straight from the fleece. Yeah, let's look at that again. <laughs> Let me, oops. And I'm trying to get, this is just a single ply. Um, here, it'd probably be better to do it that way. There we go. That is straight off the fleece. Like, sheared the sheep. I was pulling it from the fleece itself, from the edge. And I got this much on the drop spindle. Mm -mm. And I did all of that out in the weather. So... Um, I did do up a small sample. This has been rinsed, but it's not washed. So it's still a little bit got lanolin in it, you know. And so this is what it's going to end up looking like as a two-ply. Okay. So, and this was just a little sample. Um, but you'll understand why this is all I've gotten done and why it was on the wheel here in... In the farmhouse so I worked on that a little bit nothing no major progress this week except for in the dye pots so um, yeah I had 1124 yards and I dyed it and this is definitely not showing the color properly but this is a dark green and I don't know. It's still wet and drying. And this end is a, a grayish black. 
Let me see if I can do it here. A little bit showing it a little bit better there. And let's see if we can get the green here. Not really. Eh, that's probably as good as it's going to get. It looks awfully muted in the camera, but it's not. It, it's beautiful. I love it. Um, that is going to be a vest, um, an outside vest to go over like long uh, sleeve t-shirts. And it is for someone who works outside, but is always, you know, going. And I didn't want the dirt and the mud to show up on it. So that's why the dark colors, this person looks amazing in green. And so that dark green and then going to, from the dark green to the black is pretty great. I like it. Um, I'll be honest with you, the black didn't come out as dark as I wanted it. But I think it looks perfect as it grades down into the green. So, yeah. Um, the only thing that I was really, really careful, and I've noticed this with some even commercial dyed yarns that, um, okay, for example, that shawl and a cake, when they went from color to color to color, you sometimes could see the white yarn, just little blips. Um, if you don't look, you can't see them really, but that is why if you look, mine are tied very loosely and they're tied where the ties are because if you tie this off very tight to try and use this to keep it in place while you're dying it will make a white band it'll show that white underneath the dye just can't get through there so all of mine is tied loose yes it's going to have to be reskained and all that stuff um i do that after it dries and no i didn't put it in the water set the twist and all that my dye pot set the twist for me it's all liquid. It's all going to do it for me. So, yeah, we'll get into that, too. Um, so, I had that. I had just very little on the wheel. And this is four ounces. That's not a little bit. So, um, with everything I had going on this week, I'd say this is a pretty good. I got four ounces spun. Plus, I don't know how many ounces. This is straight from the sheep. And then I already have part of one of these full. So, I'd probably say maybe I've done an ounce of the other one so I probably only have three ounces this should be finished next time for you guys to see um but yeah so it's not really been a non-productive week it just has been one where it doesn't show progress okay so like in the fields you guys know that I have the grow tower set up out there I'm waiting for the seeds to sprout it's all out there in the greenhouse it was I went out there and it it started to get like cool with the we had some storms and the temperature still getting down into the 40s but when I opened it up yesterday to water and make sure everything was still moist it was cooking in there so the little greenhouse is doing wonderful hopefully we'll get some sprouts before too long um, yeah pretty much just, just sitting out there waiting for it to grow so it's not that I haven't done anything in the fields or in the garden or to get ready for planting I just waiting on it to grow <laughs> so most gestation periods for germination are like two weeks so I may or may not have um, any little green coming up next week either you know so I've already done that I water them you know that kind of stuff but just not a whole lot to actually show you um, they still look like empty flats. You know, I'm sure the seeds are down there doing whatever they need to do. But, yeah, no, no progress you can see. So, alright. RJ's World, he's roping. He's been doing pretty decent. Um, he had a little bit of a rough week because of how rough my week was. Uh, it rained. We couldn't get down here and get fence fixed. And when I say rain, I mean torrential rain. There are mud puddles in the pasture. So there's just no place for the water to go. You guys know that um, it's Oklahoma, it's a prairie, it's flatlands. So when the water has no place to go, it just sits out there and pools. So we can't get the truck into the pasture to get this, the stuff that we need down there 
to fix fence. So we can't bring in the cattle yet. Once the fence is fixed, um, it's just a matter of backing the trailer full of cattle up and letting them loose. So, yeah. But that's, he's just been roping and working horses and riding and doing for everybody. So, um, <coughs> oh, excuse me. I have my coffee here. Okay, so the most news is probably in the farmhouse. And I've thought about what order I'm going to do this stuff in. And I think I'm going to do the hardest part last so that, you know, I don't lose it. Okay, so the first thing that I did was I went to a spin-in on Friday. And I spun with Angora Jane. And, uh, yeah, we had fun. It was great. Um, she's going to come here next Monday. And so we're kind of getting it. We're just using it as a get together kind of thing, um, just because we can, and it gives us, you know, fiber stuff to talk about. And that's pretty much all we talk about is is fiber and all this. This last time we talked about the homesteading expose or exposition, whatever it was, and I did attend that. Um, I. This is where I spun. Yeah. And I'm going to get so criticized for this. If anybody watches this that does fiber, they're going to tell you flat out, oh, she's so wrong. Yeah, no, I'm not, because here's the proof. Um, so, in the fiber world, everybody says you have to process the fleece first. Okay, so there was two people there, Jane and one of her friends, spinning processed stuff. So, we had one person that was spinning commercial. She had bought her fiber and just spinning it. Then we had Jane, who had processed her own and was spinning fiber. She had dyed. It was still commercial fiber, um, but she had dyed it and all that. Then there was me, who had a big bag with a fleece in it, pulling straight from it and spinning it right on there in the grease. Um, I had several people it was a homesteading thing so people with two sheep came straight to me um they figured out that i was the one that you know didn't didn't invest hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars i could tell them how to utilize the wool and i had several and this is just an example so they decided they wanted to get a couple of sheep because they were going to clear some land with them and they wanted the wool and all this stuff and and they said we we definitely want sheep and i said okay so what do you tell me what you're going to do with this because the biggest thing amongst homesteaders is they get the wrong species to do what they want okay and then they're disappointed with the end result so um, we did the homesteading class years ago on the farm and we talked about browsers and grazers. Um, we talked about knowing exactly what you want to get done, what species does what you want it to do, and then how to utilize that species and what byproducts and how to put them in order. Okay, so that class hasn't been taught at this place, at this farm where they had the expo. So, <clears throat> I had this one guy and he came back like three or four times because he just knew I was wrong. And I told him, go Google it. So he wanted to clear brush and trees and the land with these animals. And he wanted something he could do with fiber and he wanted meat and he wanted all these things. And I said, okay, so what is, you need to prioritize. What is, what are you going to use them first? What's second? What's third? I said, the first thing you're going to use them for is what you get them for and then you consider the byproducts um afterwards and i said and then you prioritize the byproducts because and here here i'm gonna put it out there <laughs> that's hitch he's dreaming hitch hitch hey okay <laughs> he's dreaming um so i'm gonna put this out there every breed is a multi-purpose animal and if you breed your own you're going to understand exactly what i'm saying every wool can be spun 
Does it make a great wool? Not always. Does it make a satisfactory wool? Yeah. I mean, even caracoles, hair, sheep that are nasty, you can spin that stuff. Do you want to use it as next to skin? No. You know, I mean, obviously. But you also can get milk. You can breed your own. Okay? And I'm going to tell you right now, you can get milk from sheep that are producing fiber. Okay? You have to decide where your importance is going to go into. So if you want them for fiber, you're going to feed for fiber and all that stuff. And any extra milk you get is from byproduct. And if they're raising their own babies, you cannot milk them at that time. But when you wean the babies, you can milk them the same as a goat or a cow or, a, you know, whatever. So are they going to produce enough to sell in a market? Maybe not. But as a homesteader, if you can feed three of your children off the milk you have and you have six, that just cuts your food bill in half. I'm just saying. You have to prioritize. You have to know. So this guy comes and he tells me, um, we've decided we're going to clear this land and, and use the wool and all that stuff. And, and what breed of sheep would do that? And I said, okay, I want you to list it in importance to you. And I will tell you what I think you need and he lists it down and I looked at him and I said so you're saying you want a goat and he said no I said sheep I said no sir you didn't give me a species you said what breed number one and I gave him a lesson on the difference between a, a grazer and a browser and I said, sheep don't look up. So if you want your trees cleared and your brush cleared, you want a goat. Okay? It's that simple. If your main priority is, is clearing land, you don't want sheep. You want a goat. And a goat will produce milk. And their undercoat has a micron count second to none. I mean, it's up there with cashmere. So in the winter, instead of just letting all that stuff fall out, stuff, brush them. You still have a spinnable fiber. It's super soft. Okay, and there are other breeds out there. There's long-haired goats out there. Hence, Angoras. They still eat the same way that other goats do. They still put their feet up and trim all the trees as far as they can reach. They'll eat the brush. A sheep is not going to look up. A sheep is a grazer. And I said, you don't want a sheep. You want a goat. And he just looked at me, he goes, you're serious. And I said, yeah, go Google it. I said, first, you need to learn the difference between browsers and grazers. I suggest you learn that before you decide what animals you want to bring into your farm. Or you're going to be disappointed with the results. So he goes off and he comes back and he just constant questions. And he, he couldn't convince himself he wanted a goat. And I told him, I said, look, you do what you want to do, okay? Don't come to me for the answers if, just because you don't like what I'm saying and try and get me to change them. I'm not going to change the answers. I'm going to give you the cold, hard truth because I've been in rescue when you have to take the animals because you got the wrong ones. I've been on the farm and know what these animals do. I've been in fiber. I know all about that. I've done the dairy thing. I can make cheese with the best of them. I can milk my own goats. I can milk my own sheep. Um, I think I've milked everything, you know, cow, sheep, goat, all of it. Um, I know what they can do and I know what they can produce. And please, breeders out there and all that, don't tell me you can't milk something. If they raise that baby, um, when they quit and you wean and you take that baby away, there's still milk in those sacks. You still can milk them. Are they going to produce enough for what you want? Don't know. Sheep's milk makes amazing cheese. But people have it set in their mind a certain way. And I had another gentleman and YouTube, as much as we're on it, it doesn't always put out great 
information because it, for as many YouTube channels as there are covering homesteading and goats and sheep and all that, that's how many different ways there are to do things. So this one gentleman came back and he watched me spinning and he was like, you know, you can't do that. I said, oh, really? I'm doing it. Well, you're supposed to process that first. Says who? I said, and my fingers doing it out there is taking all the vegetation out. It's lining up the fibers. How am I not processing that wool before I spin it? I'm doing it in a different way. Yes, I agree. But I'm not doing it wrong. My grandmother and people in the 1800s did it this way. They didn't have combs and, and hand cards or drum carters or hackles or those things were afterwards. All that came with the Industrial Revolution. When it was just them and they had a sheep and they sheared it if they were rich enough, okay, blessed enough, however you want to put it, to have a wheel, they did it on a wheel. If they didn't, they did it on a drop spindle. And they plied on drop spindles. And they did just that way. From the sheep, shear it off, do it, wash it. Those big cauldrons that you see, people stir in the wall, they were taking the lanolin from it. You literally have to boil it out. And now if you know wool at all, you know the boiling agitates the wool and felts the whole thing. So you end up with this big blob. Then they used it in their gardens to help with mulch and all that stuff so that they didn't have to water so much. Okay. If they're boiling it, they're taking the lanolin out. Okay. The only time that they got the wool wet to process it was to wash the yarn. That wash set the twist. That wash and rinse did everything it needed to do to that fiber. They didn't dye stuff back then. You know, that it colored was the rich bought the bolts from other people and all that stuff. Um, but when it came to the wool stuff, it wasn't colored unless you had colored sheep. And that was it. They didn't dye it or any of that stuff not your average day guy i mean they they would dye a green sweater or whatever but not your average living on the prairie little house on the prairie um trying to be self-sufficient just to survive farmer didn't bother to take time to dye it um it took a lot of going and gathering uh roots and and plants and all that stuff that it took too much time. They didn't have time. They had to tend the fields. They had to cook. They had to clean. They had to take care of livestock. There was always something they were doing. From dawn to dusk, they were too busy. And dying was a luxury. It wasn't always died. I'm just saying. So, my way of doing things is not for everyone. And I get that. But... It can be done. I do it regularly and there are benefits of it. And so I talked about all of these things at this exposition, this homestead thing. And like I said, I, I was met with mixed reviews because number one, theirs were pretty colors. Mine wasn't, but I did take a naturally colored fleece to show it could be done with color. Um, and if I back this off, I don't know if I can back it off enough without ruining this. There is some of that, um, oh no, it's not on the wheel. It's on this one. I don't know if I can move enough. I did some, I don't know if you can see in there. There is some, uh, native white mill processed done in there because I wanted to show that it could be done with any of it. Okay. It, it doesn't matter. But I did have one lady show up with pen and notepad and she was taking notes. I talked about Hamacha um, and how to make sure because a lot of these people are going to the sale barns and getting them. Um, I said you need to learn to do fecal counts 
by yourself. If you have a microscope, it just takes a certain slide and there's a way to do it and find out if you're getting wormy um, or parasite infested animals. And that's something you can do yourself. Um, and so it's so worth, RJ and I both took the FAMACH class and we still use it to this day and not just on goats. Um, we use it on just about every animal. The minute we think something's wormy, we take, pull that eye down and it's a learned thing and we still do our own fecals. Um, the extension office has a microscope. So yeah, we just go and do our own and we don't have to rely on someone's word. Oh no, they're not wormy. We also have the body score. I talked about the body score um, to a lady and I have a chart and I said, you need to get that chart. And she looked at me and, and it was actually there on the farm and she had this one you pinned off by itself. She says, I don't know, she's just not getting enough to eat or whatever. Number one, she was raising a baby. So her body score was down. Number two, she was the oldest on the farm. And I took one look at this sheep, cause she asked me to come over, you know, and I'm looking at it. And I took one look at this, looked around and I said, well, this is the oldest sheep on the farm. And she looked at me, she goes, how do you know that? And I said, cause you can see kind of her teeth and the way she's eating. I said, she is just old. I mean, if you've been around sheep at all, that's the oldest sheep. I said, all these others are younger. And she goes, exactly. She says that sheep is seven years old and it didn't have its first babies till it was five. I said, it's going to be harder on its body because it wasn't preconditioned. And she goes, well, we didn't know it was bred at the time. It was an oops. So that's fine. I said, but you have to feed her like she needs extra protein and she needs extra, you know, and this lady was just amazed. She was like, oh my God. And this is the person putting on this exposition, this, this home study exposition. And she's like, I need your number. <laughs> I told her, I said, here you go. Here's my number. Um, so there was a lot of things I was told I shouldn't be doing. A lot of people infatuated the fact that I didn't do it like everything's done on YouTube. And I can't tell you how many times I was asked why you don't see spinning in the grease on YouTube and finger processing on YouTube. And I simply told them it doesn't make any company money. You know, if you're selling hackles and cards and all this, um, which most fiber artists are representative dealers, they, they have their dealer sponsorships. So they have Ashford or um, Louette or one of those. They make a line of fiber processing. That's their job. But if you don't have those things, a lot of times just selling your fiber doesn't get you a big enough income. You have to be the whole package. You can't just sell yarn and not have the things and, and rovings, okay, and and that and fleece without having some way to process it. Um, they they want to take it from start to finish and in order to do that you have to have somebody who makes wheels. You have to have somebody who makes the stuff to process it. And if you're telling people how to do it for free, you're not going to make any money on those things you're trying to sell. I am no longer trying to sell anything. Um, I never was a dealer of any line of anything. There's only one product that we backed and that we um, are actually a distributor for and that's that Greener Shades dyes. And I honestly believe in them. I did natural dyeing. I've done all the, you know, different ways. And those dyes I stand behind 100% just saying so that's it all comes down to money and making those people understand that um, it it's all about the money but it doesn't have to be because they they had wool yarn and and all that stuff all the way back in hundreds of years ago you know it didn't take all the things that were invented after the Industrial Revolution to process wool so just saying and I take a lot of criticism for that and I'll probably get some comments in this so if the comments get turned off and things get deleted it's because somebody's being nasty to me okay um yeah so that went on I did pick up I had gifted to me this now I'm not one to do a lot of fringe 
but this is a fringe maker and it's got the three sizes and if you think about it it probably does a fourth size but I don't know I don't know if this right here is the same width as this right here but it probably could do a fourth size but it is a fringe maker and it's that it's really cool that's green and black let's see if I can get the side with more greens see the camera's adjusting more to a blue there it is so it's greens and blacks and it's really cool swirled and the green is more of a neon green I don't know that you can see that but it's more of a neon green and it's made of that play with that risen risen I don't know how to say it so anyway but yeah it is what it is and I like it so when I do fringe now I don't have to pretend go find something wonder how eh, yeah no I just go find something to make my fringe off of and now I've got that and it actually is easier to stick your string in there cut it and then bobble your head so yeah that would be much better right um you can make tassels you can make fringe you can make pom-poms whatever you want to do but it will be consistent because when you wrap it you know it'll make the yarn yarn the same level the same uh length and it won't bow like cardboard because i have a tendency to use cardboard and the cardboard about halfway through bows and so it gets a little shorter a little shorter a little shorter yeah <laughs> i just wait till i'm done even though they've gotten a little, little short and then the shortest one i go and whack it off even <laughs> so a little wasteful on that and that's why i don't use french a lot but anyway all of that went on and i i did enjoy myself it just it's hard not to have people question you a lot about things that they have set in their mind because the internet says or youtube says or they found this one video that and pretty much anywhere on the internet you can either find it on youtube or find it on the internet to agree with you whether it's right for you is not taken into consideration but they will find what they want to hear on the internet i'm not saying it's wrong okay like the guy who said he wanted sheep but he really needs goats he swears that you know he needs sheep and I actually told him I said Google how California grape vineyards um, keep their grape vines clear or their their stuff clear I said they don't always mow I said it is not a mowing thing I said they can put a herd of sheep out there and they will clear all the grass all down those fields and they don't look up to eat the grapes the grapes are on a trellis and there's just the vine down here they'll leave the vine and everything else is up here and south down baby doll are notorious for being used out there because number one they're miniature and they stay low to the ground they're easy to handle they produce a byproduct wool um and yeah they often use them out in california to clear the vineyards they don't lose any grapes to them unless the grapes fall on the ground so the other thing is is that he wanted it for weed control the biggest weed here in Oklahoma milkweed guess what will kill a sheep faster than you can say I didn't know that milkweed great for butterflies horrible for sheep what do you want you want the butterflies or you want the sheep can't have both just saying so um a lot of you have to know what's poisonous what's on your property what's poisonous one lady says well we're trying to find a piece of land i said so have you found one yet she says yeah i said do you soil test yet she looked at me she says no i said did you do your foliage test yet no why would i need to do that we're talking minimal dollars at your local extension office like it's less than 10 bucks or so to have a soil sample done and as you know we learned the hard way if there's ever been in an old abandoned well byproduct is sulfur and if you're going to have alpacas too much sulfur will pretty much kill them the government came in and closed off our old well 
There's videos about that. Um, there's videos about us losing almost all of our alpacas. And we could do nothing. The vet could do nothing. I put out hundreds of dollars only to get a necropsy back to tell me that they were poison by my own hay. So people don't realize that these things are out there. If you're buying an animal, do a fecal. Do a, uh, I take that Flamacha class. If you're going to get into livestock, I highly recommend it. It's got a lot of great information in it. Um, if you're buying land, do a soil test, do a, a, a foliage test. You know, it's not just look at it and go, oh yeah, it looks pretty. That doesn't tell you the nutrients or, or if the soil is so depleted that nothing's going to grow. That doesn't tell you anything to look at it and say it's pretty. Get it tested. It's minimal cost and trust me, it'll save you a lot in the long run. But people don't know that and people aren't out there doing that. You see what I'm saying? So I took a lot of criticism just over silly stuff that people thought I was nuts. But I've lived it for how long now? I'm not nuts. I have said it a hundred times in almost every class that we taught. Do your research, whether it be on buying land. And I'm not talking about prices. I'm talking about the area, the climate, the soil, your soil test, your foliage. There's so much research you need to do on a specific piece of property before you buy it to make sure it's going to meet your needs. Unless you're just going to build a house out there. If you're homesteading or have a product in mind, I'm going to go buy this piece of property and I'm going to I'm going to put in pecan trees and grow pecan trees. If the soil won't support pecan trees, guess what? You have a very beautiful piece of property that you've put hundreds of pecan trees on and they're all dying. You just bought the wrong piece of property for what you want to do. Research. It's all about research, whether it be with animals or, or your lifestyle or your land, go research, be specific. Googling, while great for information, for general information, it's not specific to you. And it's not specific to how you're going to do things and what you want to do. And it's not specific to that piece of land. So you can't just Google Missouri and know that this is elevation and this is what grows great here because you know what if you've had an old well or they've pumped salt water out on that property it doesn't matter if you clear all the trees and the sunlight gets to it if it has a salt water issue ain't nothing going to grow there for a long time so do your research always 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 and I put it out there several times and I felt like a broken record and I'm not talking Google and all that stuff. And these people had a hard time getting that concept, except for one lady, she came with notebook and paper and she's like, where can I get that land test done? She says, we found a, a piece of property. And I said, you want soil test and foliage test? Grass is not grass. Okay. Grass is grass is grass is wrong different foliages and if you plan on having horses and plan to get a foal out of that there are certain kinds of grasses that will make her abort so do you want her out there in your pasture just eating grass that could cause her to lose her baby not really but if you haven't gone and clipped some grass and it only takes a handful so you go out there and you clip some grass and you dry it all out you take it into the extension office, they give you this little bag, you put it in there, and they test for, uh, any extension agent can tell you what all they test for, but I don't know. They, they test for nutritional value. They test for um, different stuff. But make sure that your, your greenery that's around there, even your grass, is going to support what you want to do. If you've got a field full of Lespedeza, you do not want to be a horse breeder. But if you don't know how to tell what grass is what, 
the only thing to do is take it to the extension office as it's dried out because the man or woman selling you that property doesn't have your best interest at heart. They may not even know. They might be running sheep and goats on it. You know? They're not going to have it tested. They haven't had any problems. It doesn't cause goats and sheep to abort their babies. So if you're buying that thinking, oh, I can turn it into a horse farm, you don't know. Just saying. Do your research. And I felt like that's all I was saying all day Saturday. And I had people question my <laughs> thing. I was like, you know what? Go do your research. Okay, that's all I can tell you is go do your research. Because, yeah, knowing what's a browser and what's a grazer there's a difference and knowing what species you want comes before knowing what breed you want and any animal is a multi-purpose animal if you feed them right and take care of them I'm just saying okay because everything breeds and when the baby quits drinking the milk you still have the milk now do you have large quantities maybe not you might just have a little who knows um each sheep is as different as each breed is is the fiber going to be great maybe not but if you're raising for meat you know and yes you can eat a miniature sheep you can eat a fiber sheep you can eat a fi it all makes meat every animal in the world is multi-purpose just saying so, yeah, I ran into a few things there on Saturday. And part of it is that I was a little agitated and not really myself. Um, so I'm going to talk about the worst thing that happened this week. And it actually happened when I went to work. Um, and it's not work-related. So Tuesday, um, on my way to work, I drop my little dog off, uh, Moose. He's my miniature, he's 12 pound little miniature dachshund. Dropped him off at the vet to get his rabies shot, his allergy shot, and his nails clipped. They have to sedate him to do his nails because he's a bitey dog to anybody but me. I mean, there's people in this world who just, I kill him because he won't take to him. He just doesn't like it. He likes roommate, he likes me. Even RJ's been bit by this dog. So anyway, I dropped him off Tuesday. RJ went and picked him up Tuesday afternoon and babysat him until I get off on Thursday. Wednesday night, I got a call. And I knew this was going to happen. I'm glad I saved it for the last. Moose was lethargic and not eating, couldn't stand. They didn't know what was wrong. And... I called an on-call vet that I always use and I said they're bringing him in please help my dog you know I'll pay the bill he docs really good with this so they take him over there and they worked on him till about nine o'clock I got the call probably at six or so moose had a stroke and he didn't make it through the night it's rough I've had him for six years since he was eight weeks old right at six years pushing six years this year so five and a half years whatever he was my buddy he was with me always um, when I was at work he had just started to stay with roommate he'd been with either RJ or myself his entire life RJ went and picked him up that morning, his body, and in the rain, I was at work, I was, I was a blubbering idiot, but I just kind of had to control it, get through work Thursday till 3 o'clock. RJ buried him, and then the next day he went and got flowers and planted flowers for me. Um, Thursday, you just look at me and I was just constantly crying. Just, I couldn't turn it off. 
It hurt so bad. It still does. Um, Friday, it got better. I only had one major crying fit. But all day Friday, anytime I take Hitch out, I would call for moose. And so it hit me really hard about noon after I'd called for the dog. It wasn't there. Um, it just, and it still breaks my heart. What causes a stroke? Just like in people, it's a blood clot. He didn't have anything going on with him. There was no reason. They just happen. They just happen. Some are bad. Some can be survived. Some can't. It is what it is. Doesn't make it any easier to take. And yeah, I'm still pretty tore up about it. Um, I woke up, I think Friday night, and just, I had, when I woke up, I had tears coming down my face. I was just bawling. And I don't know if I was dreaming all over again or what, but I just, for about 45 minutes, that's all I could do at 1.30 in the morning. Was cry because he wasn't here. So, it's rough. Hitch is still here. Um, I think Hitch knows something went on. I don't know if he misses him, but he's been super calm. And he comes, I can't even go in to go pee right now without him coming and putting his head on my leg. So, yeah, I get stared at to go pee. Um, he spent a long time with me and roommate because he just... I don't know. I don't know if he looks for him or, or if he even understands. So, anyway. I dealt with that Thursday, Friday. Friday I went to the spin-in. It took my mind off of it. And it was easy kind of to pretend because I wasn't here. And I wasn't at the farm. I was someplace that the dog shouldn't have been anyway. So, it was easy to um, not miss him because he wasn't supposed to be there anyway and Saturday honestly we were so busy Saturday that um, I got through the daytime just fine uh, then last night roommates parents came for dinner and of course they asked for him and uh, I just had to get up and leave the room because I couldn't roommate handled it um, I just couldn't without crying and I still can't and I still miss him and it's it hadn't even been a week so that happened he he passed Wednesday night sometime in the night Thursday morning so it's it's a hard hard blow to take because number one he wasn't sick it came out of the blue we were doing our regular thing and he's gone so he was my saving grace and savior when my kids got to a point where they didn't need me RJ's 23 my daughter's 33 you know there's 10 years between them for medical issues if you follow us that's a whole other story but when they got to they didn't need me he became my baby he was something that, you know, um, a lot of empty nesters will understand that, you know. Um, but when they don't need you, my little dog needed me. And I kept, you know, he was my baby. He was, I'd call RJ his brother. I'd say, go get your brother. <laughs> so, he was just... He's been there for a long time and he holds a lot of my secrets. He took him to his grave. So, anyway, he was somebody, and I say somebody because he was part of me. He was somebody that meant a lot to me. And I've had people leave me, ah, just a dog. No, he wasn't. He was my baby. He was my buddy. He was my other half. He was, he meant the world to me. It's like, 
taken a chunk of me away. So that happened. It's the worst thing that happened. I don't think I could get through the podcast to tell you all about the expo and all that stuff if I'd have told you that first. So I'm going to get off here. Hitch has probably got to go potty. I will see you all next time. And I will have some progress next time. It just has really been a rough week. Um, yeah. So thanks for watching. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button if you, you know, are here for the first time or whatever. So thank you very much. And I'll talk to you all later.